Today, we're taking a look at the Douglas XB-7, a curious-looking gull-winged bomber that was developed at the very beginning of the 1930s, though originally it had not been designed with bombing in mind. In the summer of 1929, the US War Department was looking to upgrade the aging fleet of observation planes that were currently in use with the Army Air Corps. At the time, Douglas was the main supplier of this type of aircraft, and they were of course keen to remain so. This led them to develop an all-metal monoplane with high-mounted gull wings, of which a contract was soon awarded for two experimental aircraft to be dubbed the X-031. However, at the same time as this, the War Department had also ordered two prototypes of the experimental Fokker X-027. This was a design that made use of several innovative features, and as such it promised to offer a substantial improvement in performance and operational flexibility over the other observation aircraft currently operated by the Air Corps themselves. Naturally, this new development rather worried the directors at Douglas, who viewed the Fokker as a potential threat to their position as the leading supplier for observation aircraft, and thus they instructed their design team to work on something better. This they did in rapid time, and in March of 1930 a design was submitted to the War Department for a twin-engine all-metal monoplane. This was then approved in an equally quick time period, and a contract was offered for the construction of the X-035 and the X-036. Both of these aircraft were very similar in appearance, each having high-mounted braced gull wings, and each being clad in a skin of corrugated duraluminium, and they bore a strong family resemblance to the smaller, single-engine X-031 which had been ordered earlier that year. Like the design submitted by Fokker, the Gullwinged Douglas featured several modern and innovative design concepts. Chiefly, it featured a retractable landing gear, with the undercarriage units attracting into the engine nacelles, though in the interest of reducing damage in a wheels-up landing, the lower part of each wheel protruded from the nacelle to soften the blow of impact. The fuselage was constructed as a semi-monocoque, and this housed the aircraft's four crew members. It was to have an observer gunner in an open cockpit in the nose, a pilot in an open cockpit just forward of the wings, a gunner in an open cockpit in the rear fuselage, and a radio operator who had the esteemed luxury of being in an enclosed station amidships. Unlike some later designs, the open cockpit arrangement wasn't much of a problem, as the Douglas prototypes were not expected to achieve face-ripping speeds above 200 miles an hour. That being said, it was not expected to be a slouch either. This was partly thanks to its aerodynamics, and partly due to its power plant. Both were powered by the 25-litre liquid-cooled Curtis Conqueror V12. These were enclosed in nacelles attached to the underside of the wing and the fuselage by a series of struts. When first ordered, the two aircraft were only intended to differ in the model of the engine used, with the X-035 having two geared versions of the Conqueror, and the X-036 having two direct drive models. However, before the X-036 was completed, the Air Corps, noticing that its predicted performance eclipsed their Keystone aircraft, decided to have it completed as a light bomber. At the same time as this, they also ordered Fokker to complete their second prototype as a light bomber as well, with the intention that the two designs would be evaluated against each other. And so, the Douglas was redesignated as the XB-7, and the Fokker as the XB-8. The X-035 was the first Douglas model to be completed. This flew for the first time in the spring of 1931, before going on to complete manufacturer trials. At the conclusion of these trials, it was then delivered to Wright Field in October for service testing. The XB-7 was completed shortly after, and after a longer series of manufacturer trials, it would also go to Wright Field in July of 1932. These trials were mostly longer due to the additional structural tests that were required, as the aircraft had been slightly redesigned to carry 1,200 pounds of bombs on racks beneath the fuselage. While undergoing trials at Wright Field, the X-035 was extensively damaged on the 11th of July 1932. Repaired and overhauled, it was then flown again at Wright Field, 
And along with the stint of being flown in air mail operations in 1934, it would accrue 999 hours of flight time before being too worn out to pass its annual inspection in 1938. By the time both prototypes were flying at Wright Field, the Air Corps' interest in the project had grown, and an order had already been placed for 12 service aircraft. This order consisted of 5 Y1035s and 7 Y1B7s. This order would be completed over the course of 1932, with deliveries taking place between August and November. The service test aircraft differed from the prototypes in a number of ways. The engines were different, with the Y1B7s receiving standardised geared variants of the Conqueror, the two models selected either having 640 or 675 horsepower, and the Y1035s were also powered by two geared versions that either produced 650 or 675 horsepower. The fuselage, having been lengthened by 11 inches to improve the centre of gravity, also had its corrugated duralumin skin replaced by smooth sheet metal. Along with this, an adjustable tab was also added to the rudder to improve handling in the event of engine failure, and the tailplane, which on the prototypes had been wire braced, was now supported by metal struts. Along with the external changes, the internal fuel capacity was increased by 116 US gallons, or 439 litres, and this was done to comply with a new directive that required all service aircraft to have a minimum endurance of two hours, plus another two on reserve, as, surprisingly, a short flight endurance was unattractive in the air force of a country that was the size of a continent. Aside from this, other changes included a modified fuel distribution system, improved engine controls and oil cooling systems, and some general upgrades to the equipment for both the pilot and radio operator. Though they boasted improved performance figures, including a top speed of 182 miles an hour and a surface ceiling of 20,400 feet, their appeal to the Air Corps was rapidly diminishing, courtesy of the sleek new design that was being proposed by Glenn Martin, the soon-to-be-realised B-10 that we covered in a recent video. As a result of this, no production orders would be placed for either of the Y1035 or the Y1B7, However, this did not mark the end of their use. In early 1934, the US civil aircraft industry was being rocked by the air mail scandal. In a nutshell, this was the result of a Congress-led investigation of contracts awarded as part of the 1930 Air Mail Act. These contracts were the result of a meeting between the Postmaster General and the executives of top airlines at the time. This closed-door affair of course prevented any smaller airlines from competing for said contracts, and their subsequent complaints resulted in a Senate investigation. The fallout of this resulted in President Roosevelt cancelling all airmail contracts in February 1934, and he then requested the Air Corps to take over the airmail routes while new contracts were being arranged. This caught the Air Corps somewhat off guard, as very few of their aircraft were suited to the task. But the newly redesignated Douglas O35 and B7 appeared better suited than most, and so they were assigned to the mail routes in the so-called Western Zone, an area that was particularly challenging. This was the most difficult zone because of the mountainous terrain, and the pilots assigned to it urgently needed to familiarise themselves with the routes they were about to fly. Unfortunately, it would not take long for the terrain and the elements to claim their first victim, as it was during one of these familiarisation flights that a B-7 crashed in Idaho. The pilot, 2nd Lieutenant James Eastman, was circling the aerodrome waiting for a break in the weather, being caught in a snowstorm, when his plane stalled and he was killed in the crash. Four days later, and in the shadow of that tragedy, the Air Corps officially began its mail-carrying duties. However, it was not an easy endeavour. From the outset, they were plagued with severe winter weather, and that, coupled with being poorly prepared or equipped for nighttime operations, led to more crashes and the deaths of 13 airmen. By the time the regular mail service was restored, three more B-7s had been lost, with an overall loss ratio of one aircraft per 353 hours of flight time. After this, the B-7s saw limited use, as they were quickly becoming worn out and made obsolete by newer aircraft designs. 
They would eventually be withdrawn from use in 1938, with all of the models ending their days in a scrapyard. In terms of designs, the B7 was a bit of a dead end, and a lot of that can be attributed to the rapid pace in which aircraft design evolved during this period. In the span of just a few years, things went from biplanes to monoplanes, and many planes were obsolete within months of leaving the hangar for the first time. Some made it, some didn't, and the B7 was unfortunately one of the latter. And so ends its story. Once again, thank you all for watching, and an even bigger thank you to my newest patrons. My goodness, you lot were very quick off the mark. And a special shout out to Deliado and Kevin for their support as Wing Commander tier patrons. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.